Let's pray. O Lord, you fasted for 40 days and 40 nights for our sake. Give to us self-discipline to pursue your word, your ideals, holiness, and righteousness of thinking. In Jesus' name, amen. We're on chapter 2 of Dr. McCulloch's benchmark volume on Thomas Cranmer. In chapter 2, it'll take us a couple sessions to cover the Cambridge years. There's a beautiful picture here of panoramic view of Jesus College in 1690. It's uh, got a monastic core of buildings around the cloister to the north of the cruciform chapel, all modified in sober perpendicular style by Bishop Alcock. I don't know, looks like the southern side to me, but I'll have to look at that again. Uh, Jesus College, Cambridge, founded by John Alcock, Bishop of Eli was only well, Jesus College was seven years old when Cranmer was sent there. This would be 1503. Remotely situated <clears throat> by the standards of the university's other college, it lay east of the town center with spacious grounds around to convent buildings from which Bishop Alcock <clears throat> had evicted the last two nuns of St. Radigand. 1496. From the nuns, the master and fellows also inherited parochial responsibilities, an unusual feature for a university church. And the conversion of the nuns' beautiful but overlarge church into a college chapel left part of the nave open for parishioners' use, with a curate chosen from the fellowship to look after them. Footnote one, for the foundations of Jesus College and on its parish, see Victoria County History, Cambridgeshire. The Cranmer family choice of Jesus for their son's university studies, and presumably maybe his father was involved in that. That's an angle we don't usually, we usually think the father dies and the mother sends him off, but maybe... The father, Thomas, was in this. Interesting new angle. This is the Cranmer family's choice. So who else was involved in this? Remains to be explained. Why not Christopher Tamworth's God House or Robert Clif Clifton's Michael House? It might have been some personal connection with Thomas's school that led to the decision. However, it may be significant that Jesus was among that fortunate group of Cambridge colleges, also including God's House and Michael House, which was directly benefiting from the patronage and interest of the university's greatest early Tudor benefactors, Lady Ma Margaret Beaufort and John Bishop, the master of Michael House. Lady Margaret, the most formidable, successful, dynastic politician of 15th century England. That's the mother of Henry VII, grandmother of Henry VIII. Found the ideal partner in Fisher for an enterprise of educational funding, which would give Cambridge a leading place in the Northern European Humanist movement during the 16th century, profiting from the university's gratitude for his spectacular success in fundraising, huh. not to mention his piety and scholarship, Bishop served as vice chancellor in 1501 and then from 1504 as chancellor. <clears throat> Jesus' rather meager initial endowment by Bishop Alcock <clears throat> was soon upstaged by the contributions of Lady Margaret under Fisher's guidance. Fisher wrote the Jesus Foundation Charter of 1496. And much of the work of converting the former nunnery 
buildings was financed by Lady Margaret and her associates in the year years when Cranmer was the first member was first a member of the college. Even the college's change of its name from the proposed continuation of the nunnery's dedication to St. Radigund is likely <clears throat> to have been a compliment to, to or inspiration by Lady Margaret. She was official patroness of the holy name of Jesus in England by papal grant. And she certainly influenced the latter change of God's house to Christ's. <clears throat> Jesus's next benefactor and writer of its first statutes was Lady Margaret's stepson, James Stanley, <clears throat> Alcock's successor as Bishop of Eli. Lady Margaret was a familiar figure at great university ceremonies in Cranmer's early Cambridge years, making frequent visits, <clears throat> which became annual from 1505 to 1507. On this <clears throat> last occasion, she badgered her son, King Henry VII, and his prince heir, to attend the university commencement with her. As a boy, Cranmer made one friend who would have linked him to the Beaufort Circle even before he went to Cambridge, John Markham, who testified to his long life, friendship, and his will in 1559. Well, we're interesting. When he took when he took care to repay the late Archbishop's son's old debt owed to his father. Markham was one of Nottinghamshire's leading families, whose estates were scattered across the same belt of Nottinghamshire, the Lincolnshire landscape that Cranmer knew as a boy. He was about Cranmer's age, and they had known each other at least since they were teenagers, as the Archbishop later warmly testified to Thomas Cromwell when Markham was facing serious trouble in Nottinghamshire. Their friendship remained strong based on their common conversion to evangelical piety in the early 1530s. And a mark of exceptional quality <clears throat> was the fact that Cranmer was prompted thus to intervene so earnestly with Cromwell in the politics of his childhood county something which he did little during his years as Archbishop. Markham was a relative of Lady Margaret's, and he entered her service before asserting his family's leading position in Midland society by his devoted service in Henry VIII's wars. Perhaps, therefore, it was the Markhams who suggested which college might be suitable for a bright young friend of their eldest boy. One other important connection was Lady Margaret's circle persisted throughout Cranmer's life. It's probably during the early Cambridge years that he got to know James Maurice, Lady Margaret's clerk of the kitchen and surveyor of her building works at Christ's and St. John's, possibly at Jesus. John's son, Ralph, would become Cranmer's trusted and long-term secretary and biographer. Once more, the Lincolnshire connection is evident. James was controller of the customs of Boston, and he inevitably had much to do with the Fenland drainage schemes, <coughs> which interested Lady Margaret. He also shared Lady Margaret's cultivated piety and the evidence remains of a significant devotional library. Footnote here on Ralph's entry into Cranmer's service on Rochford's recommendation. Uh, we're going to be reading Maurice's uh, anecdotal biography of Cranmer, God willing. Like Sir John Markham, he and his family would turn this high temperature religion to an early interest in evangelical views, but his children also sustained their prosperity on service to the great. 
after James' career with Lady Margaret. His son William served first Dean Pace of St. Paul's and later Henry VIII. Ralph Maurice was to enter Cranmer's service on the recommendation of George Lord Rochford. And in 1533, Ralph's and William's brother Philip made a spirited attempt through Cranmer to become secretary to the Duke of Richmond before becoming Cromwell's servant. Fifteen oh three, Cranmer entered the standard arts course of the university. He took eight years, a surprisingly long time, to reach his BA. Perhaps <clears throat> his admitted problems in absorbing information quickly, or even family fi financial worries, delayed his progress. There may be hints of trouble in two later negative comments on both the teaching and content of the early 15, early years. In 1551, he spoke contemptuously of one of his lecturers from 40 years before, an ignorant reader who then came to any hard chapter which he understood not, he found some pretty toy to shift off which he could make better skill of. This is a footnote. His anonymous biography provided what has become the famous description of Cranmer's first eight years of study. He was nuzzled, which means trained, in the grossest kind of sophistry, logic, philosophy, moral and natural. Not in the text of the old philosophers, but chiefly in the dark riddles and quiddities of Duns. Scotus and other questionists. The footnote here is Cox 1, page 305. Narratives of the Reformation to 18 and 19. S Tyndale, his expositions. Page 291. <clears throat> In the universities they have ordained that no man shall look on scripture until he is nuzzled in heathen learning eight or nine years and armed with false principles. However, one should remember that both these descriptions are polemical. The first was part of an attempted put down of Cranmer's Cambridge junior, Stephen Gardner. While the second is perhaps conscious echo of an angry remark in <clears throat> William Tyndale's 1530 polemic practice of prelates. I argue in Appendix 1 that Cranmer's anonymous biographer was Dr. Stephen Nevinson. If so, his experience of Cambridge was 40 years after Cranmer's, during which time a re religious revolution had unfolded, and any perspective on older partisan scholarship was distorted by partisanship. The biographer's description does not reveal that the BA curriculum, which is so contemptuously des describes no piece of dusty medievalism, but the result <clears throat> of a revision only 15 years before Cranmer embarked on his studies. Older courses of lectures were abolished in 1488 and the initial arts curriculum was shifted in emphasis away from a foundational study of logic. Thereafter, the students started with the study of works of classical literature, the choice initially left unspecified by the authorities. And he went on to logic in his third year, followed by a fourth year in philosophy. The sequence was, as the biographer describes, sophistry logic and philosophy, <clears throat> but it was a conscious attempt by the university authorities to meet the new academic interest in the direct study of the classics and early symptom of the general English reception of humanist learning, which Fisher would so encourage. Indeed, the emphasis on the classics was precisely what annoyed Tyndale in 1530 patient as he was 
to turn his education towards the Bible. Nevertheless, Cranmer's embryonic library was founded on medieval scholastic texts, which would have been familiar to generations of undergraduates, in which he often seems to have acquired secondhand in time-honored student fashion. Whatever Cranmer's later opinion of them, he preserved them faithfully amid his magnificent later collections. Dr. Selwyn has identified them. Most prominently, he points to Peter of Spain's Sumuli Logicalis to start Cranmer on logic. This is from Eris and Selwyn, which we're working through. Bound up with Peter Tartaret's commentary to tackle Aristotle's logic and philosophy, both in editions of 1500. There's much else of Aristotle or commentaries on him in editions of the appropriate date, and Duns Scotus is indeed represented as the biographer suggested, with two copies of the 1497 edition of his question subtilissima. Cranmer's Scotus is copiously annotated in what seems to be an early version of his hand. Neatly and conscientiously, he sets out responses and objections, makes notes, summarizing themes, and adds notes of other relevant authorities. Already, he is using the Arabic numeration, which he favored throughout his later life. Cranmer's first degree was taken in the same year as several friends who became important to him in his years in his, the public stage. The listing of BAs in the grace books seems to have been done in groups of colleges. Next to Cranmer in the listing of BAs was his friend at Jesus, Thomas Goodrich, and a few names followed, Richard Astall, Richard Hoare, both destined to be chaplains for Cranmer in the 1530s. Early in the list among higher degrees is D. Boston. This is probably William Benson, alias Boston, another Cranmer friend, a South Lincolnshire man like Goodrich, and the future abbot and first dean of Westminster. One sees D. Latimer, Hugh Latimer, Cranmer's fellow martyr. Another name in the same BA list, D. Nicholson, suggests a less happily associated martyr than Latimer, for this probably can be identified with John Lambert, alias Nicholson. What? Cranmer's association with the trial, which led to Lambert's burning, as a sacramentary in 1538, caused Cranmer and his later biographers much embarrassment and heart searching. A few months after the summer degree day, another figure central to Cranmer's future entered the university for the first time, Stephen Gardner, beginning his undergraduate career under the influence influential relative at Trinity Hall. Cranmer now embarked on a different course of study for the MA. Again, the anonymous biography put a polemical edge on this description, comparing Cranmer's work on his earlier course with a shift in 1511 to favor Erasmus, good Latin authors. Again, we must be aware of any Reformation hindsight in interpreting the change in direction and consider that it might have been much thanks to the university curriculum as to any revulsion towards the schoolmen on Cranmer's part. It need not even be significant that Erasmus arrived for the first extended stay in Cambridge in 1511, causing much excitement in the university. The Cambridge MA course, which Cranmer experienced, had been reformed about a decade after the BA. 
it had been widened to include arithmetic, music, geometry, and perspective. One of the items relative to this curriculum in Cranmer's library was a collection of mathematical treatises by the humanist polymath, Jacques Lefevre de Table, Faber, I don't know how to say the Latin, uh, this French, published in 1507. Footnote 16, this book was long ago disposed of by the British Museum, but it's listed in the manuscript catalog of printed books in the old Royal Library, Department of Printed Books, for a note on the identifying Faber reference in the narratives of Reformation to 18 and 19. Besides the official subjects which Cranmer had to master, his natural progression in study may have gradually led him to more adventurous reading. We have, after all, the testimony of those close to him that he was methodical, even a plodding scholar. Confer the comments of Ridley on Cranmer's progress through scholarship. This would be Jasper Ridley, pages 15 and 16. This time, his course to the next degree showed no special delay. He gained his MA in 1515 after 12 terms, but at some date, which is still uncertain, he was elected to the fellowship of the college. He was still a layman, but it, this was not uncommon among the fellows of Jesus in early years. And here we will call this at this point. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.